Well, good afternoon. <laughs> so, how many of you have been blessed by today's service so far? Amen. Amen. I do recognize that unlike last week, or two weeks ago when I preached, uh, and I had a baptism, and I got up afternoon, uh, and I preached a little bit longer of a sermon, I do realize that unlike two weeks ago, we don't have a lunch after church today, so I will be a little bit more brief in my, in my message. Uh, but to make up for that, I do have a study guide for you, which I learned an important lesson when I was at college. Don't give you the study guide first, or you won't listen to me. I'll give it to you afterward, so hopefully you'll listen to me and then go look it up later. <laughs> I'm sure Pastor Russell's learned that lesson too. <laughs> but I do want to start, uh, we've done a lot of talking from the platform. I want to give you just the chance to be able to share with one another just a quick question, a quick icebreaker. And the question today is, based on my sermon title, you see one penny at a time. How many of you still think there's a value for a penny? Talk to the person next to you. Does a penny still have a value? just out of curiosity, how many of you still like the penny, think we need to keep the penny around? How many of you think the penny needs to go? All right. Would it change the, for the people who raised their hands first, would it change your mind any if you knew that it costs us somewhere around 2.1 cents to manufacture a penny? So we, we lose money every time we print money. Anybody want to change their mind? No? Okay. I'll admit I am actually terribly anti-penny. I think we need to get rid of pennies. If you, do, if you need to know why, I'll post something on our church Facebook page, and you can watch this whole video called Death to Pennies about how we need to get... Anyway, that's... <laughs> now, as opposed to pennies as I am as a source of money, I do realize, of course, that there is some value in them. In fact, today's message is just a real quick snippet, a uh, very condensed version of what I'll be... Uh, uh, of my section or my presentation on prayer. Uh, some of you have heard that I'm writing a book on personal spirituality, and this is my section on prayer that you'll be getting. But I open with a story about how a penny actually made a huge impact in my ministry and in somebody else's walk with God. And so I encourage you to check out the study guide that I'll give you later, but I want to start by praying and asking God to bless this time as I talk about this act of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to gather together here to worship you, to see what you're doing in and through people's lives, to watch how you, you've got a hold of people, uh, to know that perhaps for uh, some of us, we've made big public recognitions of how awesome you are. And for those others of us, Lord, we, we're still clinging to, <laughs> to who you are and waiting to see that awesome revelation as we go through some of our hard times as a church family. But Lord... Through the good times and through the bad, you are still God. And so, Lord, as we talk about how we can connect with you through this tool that you've given to us known as prayer, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us and bless us and speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have ever been to an Applebee's before? Anybody? Applebee's. All right. I know some of you are not sure if you want to admit it in public. It's okay. Um, I actually waited tables for three years at an Applebee's down in the Benton Harbor area while I was going through school, and it was really kind of a fun experience. I loved waiting tables. Uh, I, before I came to, to uh, the Berrien Springs area, Benton Harbor area, I waited tables for three years at a buffet. Uh, if you've ever been to like a Ryan's or a Fire Mountain, I waited tables for three years there, and I learned how to get real real quick at helping get drinks and rolls and clearing plates. I could run a 15-table section, a party of 60 in one room, and a party of 20 in the other room. And not too bad for waiting tables at a buffet. I'd end up making more per hour than my wife who worked at an insurance company. I was pretty good at waiting tables. And then I came to Benton Harbor Applebee's, and it was a whole different experience. One thing that was different about it was, this was back in the day when you could still go into a restaurant and smoke. And the funny thing about that was, I'm the only non-smoking person on staff. 
And so they would always, of course, put me in the smoking section. It's often the slowest section, and it has the hardest closing tasks. But it's funny how God always works things out. Because though it is often the slowest section, it seems like for some strange reason, whenever they'd put me there and the restaurant is just so slow, they'd start to send servers home, and they would just say, Mike, you just keep an eye on the whole smoking section. It'll be okay. There was one night, I kid you not, when I am, a- Andrea and I are right around the corner from needing rent money. And they cut the section, and it is so slow, and I'm like, I am not going to be able to afford rent this month. What am I going to do? And wouldn't you know, the next table through the door wanted smoking. The next table through the door didn't even smoke, but they wanted smoking so they could watch the parking lot. The next table through the door, they wanted smoking. Eleven tables in a row wanted smoking. My colleagues, who had just been sent home, were actually still in the restaurant rolling silverware. And I'm running frantic, making all the money. And so it was really neat to be able to do that because I would never do it alone. It wasn't always me by myself. I had a fantastic team of managers and coworkers. And it's funny because most of them are not Christians at all. Most of them have no relationship to the church whatsoever. Uh, They actually referred to me as Father Mike because they knew that I was studying to be a pastor. (laughs) And so like if they'd swear in the back, they'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, Mike. I'm like, don't apologize to me. I'm not, you know, anyway, so they would, they'd kind of laugh a little bit about faith, but I'll never forget one night. One night in particular, it had been a really busy night in the smoking section, and my my front of house team leader was there helping me clean up. And she's uh, she's a really nice lady, a couple years older than me. She's a single mom, uh, working really hard. Uh, And she was helping me that day, and we're out here Sweeping, ta- or sweeping under the floor because we're too cheap to buy vacuums. And so we're, uh, we're sweeping and clearing out under the tables. And she stops me and she says, Mike, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah, what? She's like, I noticed that before meals, you pray. Why do you pray? Well, let me pause here. If somebody asked you, why do you pray? What would you answer? Think about it for a second. Dale is answering because he loves Jesus and he wants to talk from his heart. That's a pretty good answer. (laughs) And so for me, I was like, all right, I, I said a quick prayer right then. Lord, what do I say? And I said to this lady, to my coworker, I said, because I want to acknowledge God's goodness, I want to say thanks for all that he's given me. Just a nice answer, but, uh, you know, pretty straightforward. And she looks at me and she says, I don't know how you could do that. I don't know how you believe that God is good and that he answers prayers. She says, you see, from the time I was a little girl, I was always taught that I'm supposed to pray. And I used to pray every single night, God, give me a million dollars. And she says, and here I am, a couple of decades later, single mom, making two sixty-five dollars an hour plus tips, living day to day. God never gave me my million dollars. So why pray? She said, there's no power in prayer. Prayer doesn't work. And I'll come back to that story in just a moment. But I have to admit, part of me agrees Part of me agrees when it comes to prayer not working. And I know I stand before you today, some of you are aware, I call myself a victim of prayer. I spent the first roughly 20 years of my life as a devout atheist. And God got a hold of me, and I strongly credit the prayers of my then girlfriend, now wife, with God getting involved in my life. I look back and I say that I am a victim of prayer. But at the same time, I admit that we sometimes talk about prayer or we encourage prayers in a way that, quite honestly, is unhealthy, untheological, and it just flat out doesn't work. We'll take verses like we did for our scripture reading today. Thank you, Layla, for for reading that. Uh, But, you know, ask and it'll be given to you. And so we ask for a million dollars and then get mad 
when it doesn't come. We take God and we treat prayer like there's some secret magic formula where if we do prayer right, if we say prayer right, it's automatically going to work. And if it doesn't work, then there's a problem. And the problem, we believe, has to be with him because we did what we're supposed to do. When I was going through seminary, I had a professor who put it this way. We treat God like a vending machine. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not talking about the new vending machines. I'm talking about like one of these old ones that has the cover over the top so you can't see what's in there. And you say to yourself, man, I'm really thirsty. And so you take your dollar bill and you go to try to put it in the machine. You, you go to try to put it in the machine, and, and of course it spits it out because one of the corners is rumpled, and so you kind of flatten it out. But you finally get the process right. You put it in. You say, oh, I would love to have a Sprite. You push the button. Sold out light pops up. <clears throat> And then it's an old machine, and, and so when you, when you push the lemonade button and it doesn't respond at all, you don't know if it's, if it's broken, if it's sold out, you don't know what's going on. Confession time. Confession's good for the soul. How many of you have ever kicked a vending machine? <laughs> there we go. A lot of us treat God like a vending machine when it comes to prayer. When we do the process right, we make our demands known, and we get a bit uncomfortable with when it takes a while to get what we want. And like true vending machines, where we'll, how many times will you hit the button before you decide to cash out and go somewhere else to get, your, get what you want? We'll do the same with God. I'll make the request a couple times, but if it doesn't work, I'll cash out and I'll go find something else to get what I want. It's not just us today, by the way, who does it. Biblical times. Go through some of the most famous stories of the Bible. There were people back then who treated God like a vending machine. I think of most prominently someone like Abraham, who desperately wanted children and did all sorts of things to try to get it that were outside of God's plans. He wasn't willing to wait for God's plans, and so he cashed out time and time again, tried other things, and just made his story more of a mess. I also think of stories like Saul, King Saul, for those of you who were at the Chosen Camporee or watched along on Hope Channel. King Saul treated God like a vending machine. When he got what he wanted, he was happy. But if it didn't work out, he cashed out and he tried other methods of getting what he wanted. So we teach people that if we say the right things, if we do the right things, that God will absolutely answer our prayers. But what do we do when it doesn't work like that? How many of you have a prayer that you feel like was unanswered in your life? I see some hands going up. Yeah. It's okay to admit that sometimes you pray about stuff. And you, we expect, and honest to goodness, right here on the spot, we expect a yes or a no. At least tell us no, God. I would love to know that it's a no, because then I can get on with my life. But then I think about people like Daniel who sought after God for year after year looking for answers. When you look at the timeline between Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, for example, when Daniel is fervently praying for an answer to what those 2300 days prophecy means, we commonly, if you look, it's something like 15 years of praying this prayer between the time that he learned about what happened in the 2300 days and by the time that God said, okay, it's time for you to know what's up. 15 years. And I know for some of you, 15 years is nothing. Some of you have been dealing with stuff for twice that long, three times that long, right? And so what is prayer all about if it's not about treating God like a vending machine? Well, one of the things that I've had to learn in my own studies, especially coming into the church as an outsider, is to realize, controversial, please pray for me, but I don't believe in the power of prayer as I've really wrestled with it. I believe in the power of God and that prayer is just a tool that I use to connect with God and his power. Just like I don't believe that there's power in the Bible by itself. This is the word of God. But there are people who study this every single day and are no closer to getting to know God, the author of the Bible. To them, it is just a book like we talked about two weeks ago. For me, the point of prayer is not about the process and the ability to simply go through the routine of listing off a list of do's and don'ts, and, or more specifically, pleases and thank yous. That's what we turn a lot of our prayers into, by the way, right? It's just a list of pleases and thank yous. 
There's a problem I have with that, by the way, too. And you'll hear about that in my study guide. But if all we do is reduce our prayer time to pleases and thank yous, it all comes down to this. Thank you, God, for what you have done for me. Now, here's a whole more list of things that you can do for me. Chop, chop. Get to work. And when it comes down to what God can do for you and what God has done for you, who is the master and who is the servant? Who's on the throne and who needs to get to work? There's a, a battle that goes on in, in spiritual realm where there is somebody out there who is desperately trying to rip God off of his throne. Who's trying to rip God off of his throne? It's Satan. He's doing whatever he can to get God off of his throne, to stop him from being king of kings and lord of lords, to diminish his authority and to set up his own counterfeit system. We, by the way, refer in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we refer to the system as the great controversy. Have you heard that message today? You heard that phrase before? If this is your first time hearing it, you're like, oh, the idea that there's a battle between God and Satan, that's the great controversy? Tell me more, Jim Merrills. Um, <laughs> He'd love to help you out. That's what we're studying this fall. But Satan is desperately trying to diminish God and his character and his authority in our lives. This is something he's done from the beginning and he continues to do through to today. The role of prayer is not about any of those other things that I've been talking about. It's definitely not like God's not a vending machine. For me, it's all about relationships. It's the opportunity to connect with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the, the Almighty, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer, the Savior, as a friend. I'm not the only one who likes to connect with God through prayer as a friend, by the way. There's a book called Steps to Christ by a lady named Ellen White. She was one of the pioneers of the Adventist Church. Steps to Christ is one of my absolute... This is the book that I use as influence for a lot of my presentations on personal spirituality. And Steps to Christ is a whole chapter on prayer. And right at the beginning, she talks about how prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. You see, a lot of us get this idea, this twisted idea, that our prayers need to sound a certain way or they need to look a certain way in order to be heard by God. We marvel at some of the people at congregational prayer time. Have you ever heard a congregational prayer and you think to yourself, whoo, heaven stop for that one. I wish I could pray like that. You know the prayer that gets my attention? It's one of my, when one of my little girls says, can I pray? And they pray for everything. We're thinking Jesus for farmers and spoons and the guy who came over to visit a couple of months ago and his parents and his sister and like, that's a prayer from the heart that I guarantee will get attention. You see, Jesus looks at prayer and the wordy prayers that we are impressed by. And he says something like this in Matthew chapter 6. He'll say to them, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. When you pray, just go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who's unseen. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, he'll reward you. And when you pray, just don't keep babbling like some pagan. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. Because your Father knows what you need before you ask them, before you ask him. That's in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. Your father has, he knows what you need before you even ask him. If he isn't listening to your words, how does he know what you need? Except that he's heard it said over and over and over again in your heart. Prayer is an opportunity that we have to connect with God, to open our hearts to be honest with ourselves, and to be honest with Him. And so when we talk about prayer, 
And I know, I'm telling you, it's not about the mechanics and it's not about the process. And so well, let me, as we're running out of time here, let me give you some mechanics and some process that might encourage you to rethink how you do the mechanics and the process. One of the things that I've had the chance to learn about is structuring, especially my private prayers, around something known as the ACTS model, A-C-T-S. The ACTS model ignores, at the beginning, what God can do for you, what God has done for you. And it starts, first and foremost, by uh, adoring who God is, apart from what he does. You know why you start with adoring God for who he is apart from what he does? Imagine if I, as a husband, decided to tell you all the things I adore about my wife. And I adore how she cooks, how she cleans, how she does the laundry, and those sorts of things. I adore that about her. But the problem is, what happens if she doesn't? What happens if she doesn't cook a good meal? What happens if she doesn't do my laundry? What happens if she doesn't do any of the things that I love about her? Or, even worse, what if I find somebody who cooks better? What if I find somebody who knows a better way of folding my t-shirt so they all fit in the drawer? Which should we reply by, you need less t-shirts, but that's a different story. <laughs> Adoration is the character, and that's where we need to start. Because apart from the actions, is my wife still worthy of my adoration? Apart from what he does and doesn't do, is God still God to you? And so that's why we start with adoration. We acknowledge who God is apart from what he does. You hear me talk about this over and over and over again. What's your favorite thing about God? What about his character stands out to you? And so that's where you can start. For me, I love his creativity. For you, it might be something different. His ability to forgive. His ability to sustain the fact that he gives you the strength to get through today. Every one of you will have a different answer or some nuance to it. The next thing we do with the Acts prayer beyond adoring God is to admit, he is God and I am not. I am a sinner. And so C is confession. This is something that we really struggle with sometimes. Any of you ever struggle with confession? Do you ever try to sugarcoat it sometimes too? Like God, I know I, 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 I know I messed up, but it's not my fault. I know God, but, or we'll, we'll try to minimize it and we'll call it things like it was an accident. It was an accident that my fingers typed in that certain website. It was an accident that my arm grabbed that beverage. It was an accident that I said that word that I've been saying in my head a hundred times over. It's an accident that it finally came out. Do we ever minimize our own sinfulness? Stop it. He knows your heart better than you do. And so part of the prayer process is not telling God anything that he doesn't know. It might be your opportunity to tell yourself something that you've been too scared to admit. That you are a sinner. You know why that's not a problem to me? Because my God is a great savior. Anybody thankful for that? So before I deal with my, my own sinfulness, I remind myself of how awesome he is. Adoration, confession, and then the rest of it is TS, thanksgiving and supplications. Big fancy word to prove I have an MDiv. Supplications is prayer requests. So that's how I structure prayer. By putting God back on his throne first and foremost, adoring him for who he is. Because for me, it's not a list of pleases and thank yous. Do you think if I never prayed for another thing specifically before, God, do this. Do you think he wouldn't do that? Or do you think of because of who he is, that's just what he's going to do anyway? If I never celebrated the fact that my wife cleaned or, or things like that, do you think that she just would stop cleaning? Or do you think because of who she is, loyal, hardworking, dedicated, faithful, 
those character traits, those actions will just show up. You want to know why I'm putting such a strong emphasis, by the way, on character of God and emphasizing who he is apart from what he does? Because Jesus himself did. You ever heard of something known as um, the Lord's Prayer? When we pray the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said specifically, this is how you should pray. And then the prayer that he gives is nothing like the prayers that we pray today. The prayers we pray today are, thank you for the food, thank you for this, thank you for that, amen. Unless it's bedtime and then you have to remind yourself, don't thank you for the food, right? Jesus says, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there any action there apart from who he is? That is celebrating the fact that he is king of kings. It is his kingdom. It is his will to be done. That's where Jesus starts. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forevermore. Amen. Starts with adoration. Ends with adoration. Includes some confession. Includes some thanksgiving. Includes some supplication. But it's mainly about celebrating who God is apart from what he does. Because when we celebrate who God is, we realize that what he is not is a vending machine. My friend mistakenly thought he was a vending machine, and I know that there's many here today who have thought about that as well. And so when you ask for God to do things, and he doesn't do them, or he says not yet, you get mad at him, you cash in, you stop praying like my friend did. Might I suggest to you that what prayer should be about is reminding yourself that he is God. He's on the throne, he's in control, it is his will be done. And when he says, not now or not at all, prayer is your opportunity to say, hey, God, help me to understand. This is your decision. Help me to understand why. And so I know you're wondering. You're still wondering about my friend, aren't you? How did I answer my friend who said that prayer doesn't work? Well, it just so happened like I said, we were sweeping tables. And so we had our dust pans out and we're pushing along napkins and, and mashed potatoes and, and all sorts of fun things like that. And we're getting into the dust pans and just as she said, prayer doesn't work, I noticed that she had swept something up. And God said, use that. And I reached down and I pulled out this slightly mashed potato covered penny absolutely worthless. Not worth the time and energy it takes to bend over and pick it up. Right? For those of you who love pennies, how many of you stop to bend over and pick them up? Okay, cool. Because I'm about to tell you something awesome. You ready for this? And for the rest of you who don't, maybe you might start. God impressed upon me to reach down grab that penny and to take my friend who's been praying for a million dollars and never got it. I took that penny, I dusted it off, I put it in her hand, and I said, maybe God is trying to give you your million dollars, one penny at a time. Are you willing to take the time to take what God will give you? And she took that penny and she held it and she just froze for a second. And rather than sticking it in her apron, she stuck it in her pocket. And we continued. No more discussion about any of that the rest of the day. A couple weeks later, we're sweeping up tables, we're cleaning up. And she says, hey, Mike, just wanted to let you know I've been thinking. I want my million dollars. I've stopped to pick up every single penny that I've seen in the past three weeks. And I've started praying again. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, O oh my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
So make your prayer time an opportunity to remind yourself that he is God and you are not. What he does or what he does not do is a part of his will for you. So ask him to help you to understand why he says no or not yet. And ask him to give you the strength to bend over and pick up whatever he's trying to give to you, even if he's given it to you one penny at a time. I'd like to invite our praise team to come up here and help to sing our closing song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I'll actually let you know, um, I'm going to need some deacon help. I don't know if my deacons can help me out here, but I'm going to give you the study guide. And one of the reasons I didn't give you the study guide right away is because I've got a gift for you. You're all going home with your first penny towards your million dollars. Or you're going home with a reminder that God is good. And he wants you to have good things. So come on up. Jonathan and Shally, glad you could be here to, to help us lead in praise time. Uh, Troy, always great to hear you on the piano. Jason, nice to have you. Um, Noel, Patrick, I've got more of these as well. I invite you to stand and sing our closing song today. What a friend we have in Jesus. out there who wants to connect with God a little bit more frequently using this tool known as prayer. Not to treat God like some sort of magical bending machine and then to kick him when he's not broken or even to cash out. Some of you might have cashed out already, but how many of you decided, you know what? It's right. It's not about getting what I want. It's all about getting what he wants to give us and figuring out how to appreciate it, even if it's coming one penny at a time. Anybody here say, you know what? I want to connect with God through prayer. And I want to start working on my prayer life as well. I want to pray for you guys as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to reflect on this tool that you've given to us to connect with you and your infinite, mighty power. Lord, this is our opportunity to not only become exposed to, to everything you want to give us, but more importantly, apart from what you do, Lord, it's our opportunity to reflect on who you are and to be quite honest, who we are. We are sinners, but you are a great Savior. And so help us to not be afraid, but to come boldly. You know who we are, and you invite us to connect with you. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would be encouraged to pray more often, to open our heart to connect with you, to fall more in love. 
Lord, thank you for this tool. May we use it for your glory and for our benefit in our relationship and walk with you. Be with us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen.